For 80 years, New York City Center has welcomed some of the world's greatest dancers and choreographers into our studios. Alvin Ailey, George Balanchine, Martha Graham, and Jerome Robbins have all walked through these doors and elevators in Midtown Manhattan. The special Studio 5 series brings you into our historic studios for an intimate look at a diversity of artistic practices. Join us as we give you an up-close look at the world's finest dance artists at work in Studio 5. Good evening. Thank you so much for braving the weather to be with us tonight. Um, on behalf of our president and CEO, Mike Rosenberg, and all of us here, um, welcome. My name is Stanford Makishi, and I'm the artistic director for dance here at City Center. Um, um, this evening, we celebrate one of the most influential figures in American ballet, the legendary Arthur Mitchell. Um, our Studio 5 regulars know that we usually host these events on Monday evenings, but for this one, we thought that we had to make an exception because it's on this very day that Arthur Mitchell would have been celebrating his 90th birthday. Happy birthday, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, and to help in the celebration, we have with us two of this country's national treasures. Uh, the first is our longtime Studio 5 partner, New York City Ballet, um, whose history at City Center goes way back to 1948, when George Balanchine and Lincoln Kirstein founded the company right here in these walls. Um, and if you do the arithmetic, you'll realize that the company is celebrating its 75th anniversary in the 23-24 season. Uh, and the second company, of course, is Dance Theatre of Harlem, the company that Arthur Mitchell founded in 1969, um, which also has a long history at City Center. Um, the company has been pre performing here since the 1970s. And as you all know, uh, they have their annual home season here in the spring on our main stage. Uh, but you don't need me to explain the history of these two great companies because we have with us um, the Associate Artistic Director of City Ballet and a star dancer herself, Wendy Whalen. Yeah. Lucky us. And also former principal dancer with Dancy of Harlem and its Artistic Director, Robert Garland. Yeah. Wendy and Robert. Thank you so much, Stanford. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, so, in putting together this evening, of course, we're going to see uh, repertory that Arthur Mitchell danced, but also some of my repertory, and I'll get to talk about how the influences of Mr. Balanchine carried over via Arthur Mitchell. But first, uh, I'd like to start with a film. It's about 10 minutes long that was just uncovered at the Royal Ballet. Um, the Royal Ballet was a place where Arthur Mitchell started a program called Chance to Dance, where uh, he basically uh, created a program where students of color could go to the school, which is called White Lodge there. And so uh, they found this videotape of him way back in the day uh, talking about his company uh, on one of our many, many tours to London, England. The company was very popular there. We premiered our Creole Giselle there and many, many other things. So I'd like to show this and me and Wen will return. All right.
Good afternoon and welcome. In this afternoon's programme, we shall have the second film in our Ramayana story, and we'll be meeting a group of young people who early in the year went to Belize to build an old folk's home. But we begin with dance. In July, the Dance Theatre of Harlem paid one of their regular visits to Britain, and during rehearsals for the opening night at the London Coliseum, Peter Amina managed to talk to Arthur Mitchell about his love for dance and how he almost single-handedly put black dancers on the world map of classical ballet and destroyed forever the myth that kids from the ghetto were too undisciplined to tackle classical dance. Fingertips one, two, three, four. I believe that dance is one of the major arts and the first of the arts because when a baby's in the womb, it kicks and kicking is movement and movement is dance. And everybody's either doing uh, aerobics, jogging, running, gymnastics. Being physical and aware is very, very popular now. And that's the essence of what dance is. I'm the one that's been around for 50 years, and Dance Theatre of Harlem is only 17 years old. And I started with nothing. There were no minority dancers, so I had to start from scratch. But I'm very proud to say that around the world, the one minority dancer that's in practically every major company is from Dance Theatre of Harlem. The thing that made it successful or made the company successful and why people gravitate towards the company is, I'd say, you love to dance, transmit it. It's like if you watch someone eating a good meal, and they take a bite and they go, mmm, does that taste good? You say, oh, can I have some? Can I taste it? So if you get on stage and you enjoy it and you impart that joyousness across, the audience then re responds. It's like electricity, plus and minus. So the more you give, the more you're going to get. that it actually happened and started because of the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. I was going to the airport and I was in the taxi and they announced over the radio that he passed away. And I got very upset. And I said, why is it every time there is someone that's pulling the world together, they are taken away? And there's so many people I know that should go are still here. And I said, but you know, Arthur, you're just like everybody else because we all know what the problems are but very few of us will extend ourselves beyond our personal comfort to do something for somebody else. So I said, either do something or just be quiet. And I thought I should do what I do best, which is teach. And I was born in Harlem, and so I thought I would go back to the community where I was born and start teaching. Being that I was born in Harlem, and I was a hood at one time, I was in a street gang, in fact, I've got a couple of scars, and uh, I can talk their vernacular. I still go, hey, baby, what's happening? I mean, oh, man. I can still say, good evening, how are you? And I tried to show them, you're cutting yourself off from the rest of the world by being just one thing. Like a diamond, be many faceted. You can be anything you want, but you've got to have the technique and education and the discipline. When I got the kids off the street, the boys' classes I taught to drums, because every young kid likes drums. So I would teach a ballet class to drums. Then when I switched over to the piano, it didn't matter. 
and two. E one and two. One, two, three, four. Okay. Don't get tense. Right down there. But not back up here. No, uh, right there. Here we go. Also, there was a fallacy that blacks cannot do classical ballet. And being that I was the only or the first black classical dancer in a major company in America, and everyone kept telling me I was an exception, I said, no, I have the opportunity. And see, rather than argue with you, the best thing to do is go ahead and do it. And the major companies are slowly beginning to change. But again, there just are not that proliferation of minority students studying. For every thousand Caucasian kids that are studying ballet, there are only a hundred minority. Now, out of that thousand, maybe 50 to 100 are going to make it. So out of that 100, one out of 10 might make it. Because that's just the laws and the ratio that happens in the arts generally. But again, unfortunately, when you are the first of anything, you've got to be twice as good. You've got to be a little bit better. And it's very difficult being the only one. Being a pioneer is not easy when you're all by yourself. And I never, understand, I never understood until I got into this as an artistic director, the loneliness of the long distance runner. Because you're out there running and you're all by yourself. Now, all those behind you can always tell you what's wrong, but they're in back of you. So they really can't see where you're seeing because you're in front. So it's easy to criticize. So you're, you're saying, oh boy, wait a minute, is something wrong? I'm all by myself. And that's hard for a young person. But it's something that choice that you have to make. But then you will succeed. Dance theater is so beloved here in England. And, and it really was the first company to really establish us. And uh, every time I would go out the stage door, there'd be young minority dancers saying, I would like to be a ballet dancer. I've studied at so-and-so school. I've had this training, but no one's going to use me. And I took, started in 1976, I think it was even, 74 actually, started taking kids back to America. It's Julie Felix, who's still in the company. She's married to Joseph Chipola. Um, Brenda Garrett, who's now married to Billy Glassman, who's one of my teachers, now teaching at the Royal Ballet. And I think by people seeing dance theater and accepting that fact, when it happens, it'll be a natural thing. But the person or the first that gets in must be brilliant. It must be someone who is of star quality that you cannot deny, regardless of race, class, creed, or color, they are brilliant. Dance theater has taken five youngsters to America. Now, hopefully out of that, one of them will come back and they will ignite or spark something to start their own right here. And there's one young lady, Samantha. She doesn't have an ideal for ideal body for dance, but she's got she's got that thing, that intangible thing. Now, if she can direct that into a school and be that flame that all everyone's gonna come to, something will happen. There's a young man also, though, Paul. He has the magic. He's got it. When he comes out, it's there. And I think in time, I'm going to make him an apprentice to dance theater of Harlem. And once he gets that experience, then he can come back and work with his community. And that's one thing I always do whenever I give a scholarship to someone. I always say, at some point, you must go back to your community and give and help some other young people. Peter Amina was talking to the magical Arthur, Arthur Mitchell, Mitchell, founding... Sorry, we're <laughs> All right, so that's a wonderful, wonderful that's incredible. piece of history, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's been very interesting. Myself and Wendy have been spending the past year almost together. Yeah, since you started. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, when uh, I started as artistic director, one of the first ballets I had set was Mr. Balanchine's Pas de Dix, which we're gonna see some extras from tonight. 
uh, Arthur Mitchell adored Maria Tall Chief, who was one of George Balanchine's wives, and uh, this was choreographed on her. He was very fond of her. So Wendy came up and not only saw a rehearsal of that, but also got to rehearse Alexandra Hutchinson for the Dew Drop yeah. as well, which was and wonderful. And Kira Nichols, who and was in a ballet that you made at New York City Ballet. Yes. Staged Paradis. Yes. And taught Alexandra. That's right. The Dew Drop. The Dew Drop, which so was wonderful. we all got to have a little exactly. hangout time with you. So last summer I saw Wendy, winter time at, at, for the Nutcracker we saw each other when Alexandra danced with New York City Ballet, and now we're here again. <laughs> so we'll it's see been you at the summer and the band festival. At the band festival, yeah, that's right, so yes. A regular thing. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so the Pati Dis uh, was something that uh, was very much something that I wanted to pull back out. It's something that's rarely done, yeah? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Balanchine did several ballets from that same score, Cortez, which I think you've done, yeah? yeah? yeah. And uh, there's another one. I forget which one that is. Mm, but, um, sure. Raymundo, but, Raymundo I, but I was very amazed with Paradis. I, I had never seen it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a condensed version of our cortege hangua. It mm -hmm. seems very much just the essence of it. And, yes, um, yes. and your dancers were beautiful in it. So I can't wait to see it. OK, yeah. so without any further ado, let's see some excerpts from Mr. Balanchine's Paradis. <laughs>
dancers. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So even there, in terms of uh, the African-American influence, Mr. Balanchine uh, uh, really adored African-American culture. Yeah. You know, um, it should be understood that the neighborhood that Dance in Harlem sits in was a Russian neighborhood prior to it being an African-American one. So when Mr. Balanchine passed away, a lot of the people were, didn't, were wondering why they were going up to a small church on 153rd Street uh, between Amsterdam and Broadway, and it was because it was Mr. Balanchine's first church, a Russian Orthodox church that sits there to this day, actually. Yeah, and then, so the Russian Orthodox church was here, and directly around the corner on 152nd was Mr. Mitchell's mother's house. And so, oftentimes, he would go there, apparently, to have meals at, at Mr. Mitchell's mother's house as well. So they were not only uh, a choreographer and dancer, but also friends as well, friends as well. And also you saw the jazzy influence in that, right? Yeah. Yeah. We were talking back there that it's a little bit like Allegro Brillant mm -hmm. with that, you know, Russian flavor. The Russian the, flavor to Allegro Brillant. Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah, like, yeah. Little, Totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to move now into something that he is well known for. Uh, two of Wendy's dancers have come to perform, uh, the Agon Potida. Um, the wonderful thing about the Balanchine aesthetic is that there are the classical themes like what we just saw, and then these other uh, 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 plain practice clues, mm -hmm. ballets, mm -hmm. where you completely have to erase yourself. And I felt Arthur Mitchell was actually very special in those roles. And you were as well, actually. Oh, thank you. No, seriously. No, no. Yeah. But there's moments, I, I was telling uh, these two dancers, uh, Chen Wei Chan, it's his first time doing Agon Potida, oh, okay. and Savannah, um, Durham did it in the school, mm -hmm. but she hasn't done it in a long time, so th she's revisiting it with a mm -hmm. principal dancer, and she's, she's become really strong in her own right. So mm -hmm. I'm very excited to see them both do it. Yeah. But I was telling them there are moments of just pure classicism. Totally. So there's like Sleeping Beauty moment, and yes. then another idea. And then comes. another idea yeah, so, happens. So it plays with the classicism, and then and it so, twists And so when, on when it. you yeah. say that, how, how did you approach it? Because I, I felt that that was always Arthur Mitchell's strength as well. He was able to yeah. code switch, we call it now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was taught those different ideas. I, mm -hmm. You know, every, every new generation has a generation before, hopefully, teaching them the ideas within it. So mm -hmm. I had specifically Heather Watts giving me ideas. Mm -hmm. which, and she was very different than someone like, Diana Adams, That's or Suzanne right. Farrell, or Suzanne, so, or Allegra, yeah. so yeah. Maria Caligari, and, right? Yes. And they all have a different flavor and a different feeling and a different understanding of, of how they want to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I did, we did a crossover once with DTH, and I think you choreographed yes. a piece at the same time. But, yes, I did the one for Kira. I did. Yes, but you did the Agon Potter. I with, did the Agon Potter with Donald. Donald Williams. That's right. And That's we right. had two DTH dancers dancing Slaughter on Tenth Avenue. Slaughter on Tenth Avenue with with dancers from our company. That's right. So that was a long time ago, mm -hmm. but it was really fun, and, I, and that was my one coaching session with Mr. Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And he came in and gave me some ideas on mm -hmm. this potida, which I had done a lot with other partners, uh -huh. but, but now I was doing it with his dancer, Donald right, Williams. Right. And I remember him being very calm in the room and very calming towards me. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then sort of teaching me that it doesn't have to be crazy or loud or, you know, mm -hmm. overly athletic. Yeah. And because there's different vibes to it. And, and mm -hmm. I, I really liked thinking about it in that different way that yeah. he brought into mm -hmm. my understanding. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, he said that when uh, Mr. Ballinger was choreographing it, they were actually off as dancers oh. as a company. And so they were in on their own time, oh. devoting their time for free, actually. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Stravinsky hadn't finished the work yet, so they would wait for an hour for, I guess he called it a mimeograph or telegraph, like somehow. A telegram Stravinsky, with the music. Yeah, Stravinsky was sending yeah. the music sheet by sheet, and then Mr. Balanchine would choreograph to it. <laughs> and then, exactly. And then they would just wait for the next bit of music. Um, the other uh, interesting thing about the Agon Potida is that, um, well, just about Mr. Balanchine's career, is that he was a very much a musician, mm -hmm. he's a musician. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Agon Potter featured 
a very popular form of music at the time called 12-tone music. Some of it's called serialism for the musicians that are here. Um, it's a very specific way of making music that is mathematical in origin. Uh, so the music has a very modern sound to it. Uh, but, but eventually, when you learn it, you end up capturing the rhythm of it as well. Yeah, the rhythms are very important. And I, and I was also working with the dancers. And sometimes you count. And a lot of times you don't. You really mm -hmm. just listen for that cue in the music. Yes. Or you, you respond to your partner's that's right, that's right. gesture. So, and that's a very different way to approach choreography. Yeah, yeah. So. You know Charmaine, you know Charmaine Hunter. Yeah. Char Charmaine, a, a girl would come into the company and, and, and everyone would be like, go learn it from Charmaine. And Charmaine was like, I know the counts. And she'd go, here are the counts. Bing, bong, bong, <laughs> bong, 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 bong. And exactly. no one ever knew what she was talking about. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But you did know, yeah. eventually. So, all right, are we ready to watch? I think we're ready. All right. Yeah. Savannah Durham. Savannah Durham, Chum Wei Chan, and our amazing pianist, Elaine Chelton. All right.
my God, were you back there doing this? I was I'm like, so Wait. proud. Yes, I, I know so you proud. are. That was beautiful. It really, wow. Yeah. Really beautiful. Yeah. That, that, that ballet just brings back such memories. I learned yeah. from Sarah, Sally Leland. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the first things I learned when I got to do teach as well. Mm. You know, and it was hard. It's you know, hard. Very, yeah. very hard. Yeah. You know. it's, it's, it's an IBM computer. Yeah, exactly. In ballet exactly. steps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that um, always impressed me about Mr. Mitchell was the fact that he uh, was able to be that blank slate for, for Mr. Balanchine always. Mm -hmm. You know, when he wanted to experiment, do something new. Part of um, Mr. Balanchine's motivation to moving here was jazz music. Mm -hmm. You know, and he hung out a lot in Harlem according to Catherine Dunham, <laughs> you know? And so he, he also choreographed, choreographed around five black Broadway shows as well, you know? So he's very familiar with the black dance community. So in moving forward as a choreographer, you know, I kind of took it a little from what Mr. Balanchine had already done as an example with Mr. Mitchell. There, there was always jazz in a Balanchine ballet. Totally. Even when it's a classical ballet, mm -hmm. there's a moment where... Where, there's, where that thing Yeah, happens. there's like, okay, here's the jazz. Exactly. So, yeah. Like, even in the Agon Potter at the end when it oh, all changed. Oh, totally, and, totally. Boom, boom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's all there, all there. Mm -hmm. So the next excerpt we're going to see uh, is um, from one of my ballets, Nyman String Quartet Number 2. Uh, and so what I attempted to do, or have attempted to do in my work, is exactly that same sort of thing, but extending it much more into the African-American vernacular idea. Although it is existed in Mr. Balanchine's work too, via Arthur Mitchell with Slaughter and all his other ballets, you know. Um, so, so that was always um, a wonderful thing, working with him, because he was always able to uh, articulate to me where those things happened. I did Four Temperaments. Mm. One of the first things I did was Four Temperaments by Mr. Balanchine, mm -hmm. phlegmatic. And I was doing this one step. He was like, Robert, it's just a camel walk. That's all it is, is a camel walk. You know, the, uh, yeah, you know, which is a jazz step where you slide forward, slide, 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 and go back, back, back. Yeah, but I made this big deal out of it. He was like, no, 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 chill out. You already have that in your Simple, yeah. culture. Yeah, so, so that was always a thing with him. So yes, this uh, Nyman String Quartet, I choreographed when Mr. Mitchell passed away. Uh, it was uh, the solo in it particularly, um, I dedicated to him because uh, I felt that he, he was also um, very much acquainted with John Carlos, the gentleman that, from Harlem who during the Olympics stood with the raised fist on the podium. And so um, that iconography in the solo, um, I added in the Nyman String Quartet. Um, I, I also was sort of inspired by, uh, in that solo, the uh, square dance solo. Oh, yeah. The square dance solo for the male. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a male in the balancing ballet, it's like you look for those moments where you get to dance. Yeah. Yes, because yeah. <laughs> uh, he very much was a ballet as woman kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to speak to that at all? Or? Well, it's, it's interesting how he gave Balanchine gave some men some of the most poetic solos, cha very challenging and difficult, but, yes. but they could put their heart on the stage mm -hmm. as a solo man, which Absolutely. is a unique Absolutely. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I guess without any further ado, let's see the yeah. Nyman String Quartet. Yeah. We'll see two movements. Uh, one movement I call Fast and Loose, <laughs> <laughs> and then this uh, uh, the solo. All right, here we go.
So, as you see, <laughs> I put a lot of African American culture in my work, mm -hmm. and it comes directly from working with Mr. Mitchell mm -hmm. and, come, and the freedom mm -hmm. that Mr. Balanchine gave him mm -hmm. in working with him as an artist as mm -hmm. well. You know, um, and not for nothing, Lincoln Kirstein as well. You know, um, he took his own life in his hands actually in 1933, mm -hmm. because France and, or Paris in 1933 was a hotbed, you know, for a person of Mr. Kirstein's culture. And so uh, I thank him yeah. posthumously for that sacrifice, to which Mr. Balanchine initially said no. And then he, you know, kind of, I've read like five Balanchine biographies. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> cover to cover. Yeah. So, so yeah, and, and eventually uh, got here and created the wonderful legacy that we have now. Um, Mr. Mitchell, oftentimes, uh, when coaching the Four Temperaments again, would always say, watch your face. And so, I don't know if you noticed that in the, in the beginning, but yeah. it was definitely that idea because I wanted to honor him in that way as well. Yeah. That's an agon too. Oh, show sure enough. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right, 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 right. Okay. So it's, Mr. Mitchell balancing was uh, consistent as well as Mr. Mitchell. Yeah. Constantly yeah. in connection with the past and the what he learned and the history of what he's done and that's right that's right yeah yeah so uh we're coming to the hour mark and i think we do have a q a coming afterwards right stanford is that right oh no okay <laughs> all right um well the next thing uh, that we're going to show and i think it's the final thing uh is a, a section of my ballet nubach uh, Nubach was a ballet that I created a long time ago, September 11th, uh, the year of September 11th. Uh, we were to have a season starting somewhere in September, and then that happened. Mm -hmm. And we decided to go in and have the season. So my ballet, yes, Nubach was premiered at that moment, but I will always be reminded of that. I have pictures of, we were doing the tech rehearsals in Purchase College. And uh, Mr. Mitchell, I called everyone and said, you know, stay where you are, you know, and we'll figure out how to get you back from purchase. Dion Figgins was a part of that group. Dion Figgins is an alumnus sitting in the front row who now runs Ballet Tech, yay. <laughs> yeah, uh, but she was a part of that group. And so uh, I will never forget that, that moment, but, but we premiered it and the ballet has stuck around all this time. So what we're gonna see is the third movement of Nubach, uh, which um, was choreographed, I should say, on Tanya Wyman and Donald Williams as well. You know, the debonair Donald Williams, yeah. Uh, and um, so let's go ahead and watch this, yeah? Okay. All right.
Okay, so I'm going to use this opportunity to pitch our season here, April 11th through the 14th. Uh, if you really, really want to come and see more of all those valleys, please, please come. We would love to have you. Uh, it's, we, or we have several different uh, offerings on our gala night. We have an HBCU Divine Nine night for those that are interested, which is going to be really raucous and really fun. Uh, and, um, and lots of other things, and of course, some, you'll see the full versions of the work that we just did. So, uh, so Stanford, I think that's it, yeah? Wynn, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and let's keep doing this. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Stanford, would you like to come and wrap up any, everything? Thank you, everyone, thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>